Coming up, rocket launch. Parachute test. Space launch system mini me. Plus, we're gonna be talking about space evangelism. Stay tuned, tomorrow begins right now. And welcome to tomorrow, episode 7.18 for Saturday, June 28th, 2014. My name is Benjamin Higginbotham. With me as always, the beautiful, lovely, wonderful, and talented Carrie Ann Higginbotham. If you're joining us live, we just had a fun session looking at the Low Density Supersonic Decelerator, LDSD. We were watching it live and as a community kind of participating. So I encourage you every Saturday at 2100 Coordinated Universal Time to join us live. It's a, it's a lot of fun. Before we get started with some space news, uh, let's go ahead and thank all of the patrons of tomorrow who have helped make this episode go. These are the patrons who have contributed at least $10 for this specific episode. You can get more information at patreon.com slash T-M-R-O, we are a crowdfunded show, and so every single dollar helps. You know, $10 per month or per month per show is a lot for a lot of people, yeah. uh, but you don't have to contribute that amount if, if there's a different dollar value that works for you, and you'll see that a little bit later on throughout the show. All right, as, as I was mentioning um, in the open, um, we did just watch LDSD, the Low Density Supersonic Decelerator. We don't actually have video because it literally just happened right <laughs> before we went live, um, but it looks like they did have a bad parachute deployment so the basic idea is this is a uh, te technology to help us decelerate as we come into an, a low atmosphere, a low particulate atmosphere like Mars, right? right? So the Mars atmosphere is dense enough to become a problem, but thick enough to still, what am I trying to say? But not thick enough to actually help go. slow you down correctly, <laughs> like on Earth, right? Right. <laughs> dense enough to be a problem, but thick enough to be a problem is what I almost said. So uh, what this does is it's basically... Um, this deceleration system that um, inflates kind of on the outside, mm -hmm. that inflation is called the SIA, the Supersonic Inflatable Aerodynamic Decelerator. It kind of it creates this balloon on the outside of the heat shield, almost doubling the size or over doubling, I, I don't remember, uh, the size of the uh, aerodynamic surface mm -hmm. that it can use to aerobrake right. in the Mar Martian atmosphere, or in this case, the upper Earth atmosphere. Um, looks like they are going to get data from this, so data is good because it is yeah. a test vehicle. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, in the chat room, they're like, oh, it failed. Well, it, it didn't fail. It's a test vehicle. Anything that happens to the vehicle, whether it was expected or unexpected, is data and is good. Right. So uh, congratulations to NASA, and I believe this was a JPL project. I I remember, you right? can learn from your mistakes. Absolutely. And and um, uh, it looked it was really cool. It was really fun to watch. All right, moving right along. Uh this uh, last week on June 19th at 19.11 and 11 seconds coordinated time, nice. Russia launched Dep Depner, Depner, Den I can't say, De Depner, Den uh, with 37 <laughs> satellites. Here's some launch footage. Vusha goes. Uh, this is a Soviet-era ballistic missile. It's been modified to haul spacecraft instead of, you know, nuclear bombs. And uh, the payload is the most number of individual satellites ever launched on a single rocket. That number, again, was 37 satellites. You better believe these are CubeSats, because that's not 37 full satellites. No. <laughs> um, most of those payloads are going to turn back towards the Earth, gab gathering imagery for environmental and security purposes. And this is the 20th flight since 1999, if you look at the side graphic, actually it says uh, tw uh, 19 successes, which means there was one failure of Aww. the flight. Yeah, uh, and this was in, if I remember right, this was a three-stage configuration because you can these you can get the Depner rocket in three, four, or five stages. If I, I believe this was a three-stage rocket, but I don't actually have that data in front of me. You can get it. Well, if you have enough money, <laughs> <laughs> certainly anyone can buy one if you got enough money. Uh, <laughs> Speaking of Russia, they're eyeing the Soyuz for upgrades to allow for a lunar, like kind of Apollo 8 figure mm -hmm. style around the moon, but for citizen astronauts. Uh, so cool. Tom Shelley of Space Adventures is the president, uh, was speech speaking at the National Space Club in Florida on June 10th. And uh, 
basically talked about this this program. Now, the Space Adventures, they're the guys who let you go out and, uh, as a space tourist, go up to the International Space Station. Mm -hmm. uh, Tito went as a space adventure participant. Right. Um, and now they want to do tours around the moon. The difference is uh, $52 million to get to the International Space Station, but $150 million to go around the moon. And that's kind of a Soyuz at the moon simulated graphic. As nice. You know. Yep. Um, but you can't just take a Soyuz and send it to the moon. That's right. not going to work. That would suck if you've ever seen those photo. The, but wait, the space shuttle went to the moon. <laughs> the space shuttle did not go to the moon. Do not send that. <laughs> <laughs> Don't do that. If people actually think that. Don't do that. Uh, fine. Uh, so uh, the Soyuz co contractor Energia plans to modify the spacecraft for what's needed to get to the moon. There's going to be things like an additional heat shield on the bottom. There's going to be a habitat module that's going to go with it because you don't want to spend, you know, essentially a week. It's a, it's three, three there, three back, and kind of one in, in an extra. So by basically a week um, in this. I mean, the Soyuz is tiny. You're like shoulder to shoulder like this. You can't do that. So there's a hab module. Um, uh, there were other things as well. Oh, uh, they need to upgrade the ship's communication and nav systems to support a mission that far out because Soyuz was not designed for that. Uh, but it sounds like if they aggressively decide to do this, late 2017, 2018 is when they could actually start doing the first missions around the moon. I thought this was really cool because this is yet another, another example of a... It, it's, I don't want to call it commercial space because it is a government rocket. Right. But it is, it is a commercial application for a government rocket. Yeah. And, and this is kind of... We saw the space tourists with um, the Soyuz rockets up to the space station. Mm -hmm. Now this is going around the moon. But with space station, now we're seeing like X-Core, Virgin Galactic, those kind of like right. space touristy companies kind of on the horizon here six months away. Um, maybe we'll see uh, the same thing. I, I know, the laughing in the control room. Uh, maybe we'll see the same. They will fly, by the way. So there was a while ago when SpaceX was only six months away from yeah, flight. And true. now they actually are true. flying, right? So right. they will. all these companies will hit that. And this is kind of that first step into that awesome next thing for humans going to the moon. Mm -hmm. More than just the government moon, like commercialized lunar transportation, lunar right. habs, right. stuff like that. I think it's pretty cool. So this is that first step. And I think it's pretty exciting. It is. Um, <laughs> Speaking of Russia, still, uh, they called off the maiden launch of their new uh, Angara rocket. This is a rocket that's been in the works since, oh god, the 90s. Uh, 1992 is when they started. Really? Uh, oh yeah, 92. So this is what it looks Ouch. like. Uh, this is uh, two shots, one on the pad and one kind of out to transport. It comes in many different configurations. The first maiden suborbital test flight was scheduled for June 27th. They got pretty far into the countdown, but then they had to call it off. Uh, this is the rocket family, so this is what what all the different configurations will look like. Uh, it's designed to take anywhere from a small payload up to a large payload into orbit. And uh, actually, that is not the graphic I wanted to send. That is the old version, the new version I forgot to create. So awesome. pretend like for a moment like that's the new version. Okay. And that's yeah, the, no, I mean, that, that looks great. Graphic. Look at that. <laughs> that's, that's, that's amazing. My fault. My bad. I put the wrong graphic up there. <laughs> <laughs> I have it in my Photoshop file. Anyhow, uh, they haven't disclosed what went wrong in the countdown, but they basically have been told, look, don't ru race this thing. We've waited long enough. You don't need to rush to figure out what the issue is. Um, uh, but yeah, this is going to essentially replace the uh, Rokot and Proton rockets, mm -hmm. if I remember right. Um, yep. Uh, yep, uh, from Russia. So this will kind of consolidate everything over. At first, it's not designed to be human rated. The initial flights are cargo only, but it is eventually designed to carry humans up to space as well. So this could essentially become kind of a unified core. And that's the neat thing about this rocket is it has a unified core um, that right. you basically just kind of move around along the different uh, systems. So it's kind of the same unified concept as the uh, Atlas Delta rockets that we're using here in the U US. You just kind of keep tacking cores on the side for however much like Lego bricks like Legos Russia built a rocket Lego yay yeah, isn't that awesome International Space Station is going to get an x-ray machine this is crazy pants uh, well and the thing is that like last week uh, or was the week before I don't recall uh, we talked about the International Space Station getting an espresso machine yes which we all went gaga well, no over. actually no we, we talked about it on the After Dark show oh that's that right wasn't a, that was only available live and only available to patrons so um, yes yeah, so they're getting an espresso machine right and an x-ray machine now. And an x-ray machine. Are well, it's what every International Space Station needs. <laughs> this is their first medical x-ray scanner. Uh, they're going to use it to study uh, rats. Basically, here's what happens. You go up into space and you start losing uh, muscle and, and bone, bone density. Uh, density. Right. And you can do this insane regimen of re exercise and um, eating healthy and a bunch of different things. And you can minimize it. Sure. But you haven't been able to... to 
eliminate it completely. Right. And if we're going to be a spacefaring civilization, if we're going to go out to Mars, we're going to go out beyond Mars, we're going to go as far as we want, we need to figure out what's going on here. And that's what this x-ray machine will help us determine. Mm -hmm. We are also sending, so this is going up on the next SpaceX uh, commercial launch. Uh, up to the space station, mm -hmm. so sometime in August. And then it, they're also bringing up ma mice and rats, 20 of them, to help with the experiment itself. So they're gonna send the mice and rats up, they're gonna let the mice and rats get used to zero G and kind of their habitat, right. let the astronauts get used to tending for and caring for the, the mice Aww. and rats. And then we're gonna start doing some x-rays and seeing what we can figure out about bone and muscle loss. And this is also the first time we've had a radiation experiment on the space station. Now, station is hit by radi solar radiation all the time, right. but never anything like in station. That's kind of a unique, <laughs> a unique new thing that we're doing, putting a big x-ray machine up there. And, uh, you know, x-rays aren't easy to do necessarily here on Earth, and then they had right. to customize it for the specific needs of space, making sure that, you know, nothing's flammable, or if it is flammable, um, that doesn't release toxic gas, right? right? Stuff like that. It's, it's very cool. I, I love the idea. See, I, I should have... I should have thought at the last minute to move this up at the front of the story. Orion oh. passes its full up parachute test. Ah. <laughs> See how that works? I do. Here's some video. Uh, this is actually, this was a Google Hangout that they ran live. And uh, so you can actually watch the parachutes opening up. And uh, this is for the EFT, which is Exploration Test Flight 1. It's a four and a half hour mission. It's going to launch Orion, our next gen spacecraft, atop a Delta IV Heavy. And then it's going to go up to really high apogee and then kind of come back as hard as it can at about 20,000 miles per hour. That's designed to replicate a lunar re-entry. These were 116-foot main uh, main chutes. They're, uh, yeah, 116-foot diameter main chutes, excuse me. Uh, there are three of them. Now, this was not the last test. This is the last full test of all three of them. But there will be, uh, th I think, three more tests that involve just the individual shoots. But this is the last time we have them all together. It was a, um, d should I say smashing success? Because smashing Aww. success indicates that it didn't work. Aww. No, bad pun, no, doesn't work. No, it was a success, it was a huge success. They work exactly as planned. So EFT-1 is on schedule to launch and test uh, this December. It's gonna be, That'll be awesome. pretty freaking awesome. This is our next generation capsule designed to go send humans back out into deep space again. Mm -hmm. That's really freaking cool. Very, very cool. SLS Mini test firing. Check this out. This is a teeny tiny version of the Space Launch System. It's a scale model. They did this for the Space Shuttle and for Ares 1 as well. What we're doing is testing for acoustics. So we're seeing what's going to happen with the acoustic shock waves on this particular vehicle when we fire it. So you can see all the different test, little test engines. They have teeny tiny little engines in there that are test firing. The reason we do this is they need to update the sonic suppression systems on pad 39B, which is where SLS will launch from, so the space launch system. So uh, they did it with the space shuttle. They learned some stuff about how the right. shuttle was going to react. They changed the, uh, the water suppression system. So when you watch a shuttle launch, if you go back and watch one of our... Uh, uh, launch coverages you'll see the uh the, like there's this huge point where just it, the pad is just doused with water right that's what they're going to be testing for and trying to see what they can tweak and do and change and very cool uh, yeah absolutely very cool. uh let's do two more quick stories here the planetary society is going to make a major announcement on july 7th uh this is in regards to light sail one mm -hmm. uh, this is kind of what light sail one looks like it's basically a cube sat with solar sails on it and this is important because it's going to show how a cube sat can use solar sails to create a reliable form of propulsion for like an orbital maneuver, trips beyond our planet, moving mm -hmm. out there. Because right now it's CubeSats, they can kind of go up there and not do much else. There's no propulsion system on a CubeSat, they're too tiny. Right. tiny. But this will enable low cost interplanetary uh, research that we, potentially, right, with this right. test, that we can't do today. There's gonna be a live webcast on Thursday, July 10th from 2 to 3.30 a.m. coordinated time. That's actually July 9th for those of you in the U.S., the evening of the 9th for right. the, those in the U.S. And they're gonna make a major announcement about the project. Uh, Planetary Society CEO Bill Nye, radio host Matt Kaplan, and special guests, including the program manager Doug uh, Stetson will be there. Very and cool. they said, and I quote, the evening will climax with an exciting announcement about how Light Sail will begin its journey. So it sounds cool. Actually, this is kind of that next step to helping drive the cost mm -hmm. of space down. Mm -hmm. So pretty exciting stuff. Our last story today, 
Travel to space for seventy-five thousand dollars. Virgin like, Galactic what? at two hundred fifty million million thousand. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Oh, poor. Virgin PG. Galactic's at uh, two hundred fifty thousand uh, dollars. X Core when they fly will be at a hundred thousand dollars, or you can do it for seventy-five thousand dollars, kinda. So what that is, this is what it is. It's a balloon to space, and I'm air quoting space, and you can't see me do it. That's because it's not actually to space. At least you're not air quoting balloon. <laughs> you know, it's really a balloon. Uh, this is going to go up to 30 kilometers. Mm -hmm. It's going to miss space, which is generally uh, accepted to be at about 100 kilometers, mm -hmm. by two-thirds. So oh, cool. it's nowhere near space. It's kind of like the Red Bull jump, right? Where you go up right. in a balloon, you go up really high, you can see the curvature of the Earth, but here are a couple of key differences. One, you will not experience zero G. Right. Uh, two, sucks. you will not actually cross the boundary into space, making you an astronaut. Oh. So. Yeah. Two key differences there. Why does right? it look like that thing looks like a a, a can of Tang? Does anyone else know? <laughs> does it that? really? Yeah, it does. Like, well, because it's orange, I think is the problem. It's orange with white caps on it. <laughs> and so, see, look at it. Look, look, look. It kind of does like a, a little big bit. Big old can of Tang. A little bit. So. Uh, <laughs> You may not be going to for realsies space, but you will be able to go up there, see the curvature of the Earth. Unlike Virgin Galactic, where Which you get five cool. minutes of weightlessness, right. uh, you get um, um, you get two hours and you get like a bar, and it's like right. six of you and two. How many people is it? Do you know? Uh, I uh, don't know. It's like four. Anyhow, it's, you yeah. get a really long time up there. It's an experience. So. Um, it's more than just kind of going up and saying, yeah, I was an astronaut, I got to go into space for five minutes. It is an experience. I'm, I'm not 100% sold on it yet, but I'm more sold on it than I was like a year ago. Sure. Well, but like with Virgin Galactic, you have got to go through the physical, you got to go through the... This is more like the world's ultimate hot air balloon ride. Yes, it is. It and is. and that's still a really cool thing. Yeah. It, it is. All right. Before we go to break, I did want to give a huge shout out to the Euro Space Center in Belgium. Oh, yeah. Uh, we actually got a note from oh, yeah. NASA Edge. They said, <laughs> we are at the Euro Space Center in Belgium. I was walking by a computer monitor and saw this, that picture on the right. That's right. That's Space Vidcast coverage of the space shuttle from... And it, it's hard to tell, but right along the top, you can see our old logo. Yep. All right. And then along the side, you can see graphics that Ben very specifically made. So uh, I know for sure it was him. Uh, <laughs> but, but the logo sort of gives it away. And, and then it said, ever heard of Space Vidcast? And Chris is like, oh yeah. Oh yeah. So, huge <laughs> shout out to ESC and if you work at a company that watches Space Vidcast or you've got like uh, like Perforce is a good example, oh, right? Perforce Where they put awesome. Space Vidcast coverage up on a wall. Send us pictures of you guys doing that. We'll give you a shout out in the show. Alright, we're going to take a quick break and when we come back our main topic, which is do you ever try to be a space evangelist to your family and friends? No. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Look into her face, the determination in her eyes She won't give up a quick or from a little fashion lies Films on some expectation, this girl's a fascination Nothing in her way will keep her from her destination Cause she's firewalking, she's firewalking When it's hot, she keeps on moving Welcome back to tomorrow. Uh, before we get started with our main topic, I did want to give a huge thank you to all the patrons of tomorrow who have helped make this episode go. These are the people who have contributed at least $5 to this specific episode and are um, helping to make this show happen week after week. And if you'd like more information on this, you can head up over to patreon.com slash tm. R -O. All right, let's go ahead and get into our main topic this week, which is, do you ever try to be a space evangelist to your friends and family? Now, this comes from a posting <laughs> on Reddit in yeah. r slash r slash SpaceX. If you want to go ahead and read this one, this is from, uh, I don't actually, I didn't put the name in there. Oh, how did you miss that up? I don't know, but I put All it right. in the graphic, which you can't read from here. That's so hilarious. everyone else will have to read the name. Yay, the name is, yeah, I don't know where it is. It's right uh, there. It's right. You go ahead and re read that. Oh, you suck, man. Zina really? Zina I don't know. Anyhow. All right. Anyhow. Yeah. Anyhow is exactly it. So um, I follow space goings on as close as I can, and I find it incredibly interesting and awe-inspiring. Yet, when I talk to my coworkers or even family members about space-related things, they just seem to shrug it off like, why should I care about that? 
I keep finding people who don't even know that we have a continuous human presence aboard the ISS, let alone care that we do. That's the International Space Station. Yes. Uh, if you are successful in your attempts to get others excited about space, what do you find is the key? And does it just depend on the person? Or in some people will never move beyond, I just don't care about space. Yeah, actually, I, I thought that was an interesting interesting comment because we are here to get people excited about space. So right. do we talk to our friends and family about space? All the freaking time. I'm sure they <laughs> are nauseum. sick of hearing <laughs> me talk about space and how they can go to space, all the cool things happening in space, right. how humans can go to space. Space is the most awesome thing ever. But just shut up, man. We get it. Uh, but yes, absolutely. Because I do think it's some of the most important stuff that we've done. And I have encountered certain people who just will not whether they're just doing it to spite me right. or just do not see the advantage uh, to going to sending humans into the cosmos right. i absolutely have met those people interestingly enough more in the midwest than out here on the coasts i think yeah. it's partly a culture thing yeah i think there are some people who are just kind of like set and this is the way it is and yeah don't mess with my world right. and other people who are like um, no, I mean, anything's possible. You can do anything you want. Right. Why not? Absolutely. But I thought it would be interesting to ask the question in the show, because I thought it was a really good question of mm -hmm. what techniques work for you? Mm -hmm. it, sounds, it sounds terrible. It sounds like a, uh, like a multi-level marketing, like, how do you get other people to sign up under your business? Right. Interested uh, and excited about space. But how do you get other people excited about space? Sure. I, so... Um, one of the things that I sort of always joke about is that I use the biggest billboard that I have for space, <laughs> which is I'm always, almost I always don't have that billboard, though. wearing a space-themed uh, t-shirt of sorts. Uh, if, if it's not space-themed, it's usually Disney, but if I can... And if I can, and I always do, uh, find a space-themed Disney t-shirt, then I, uh, that's even better. Boom! As far as I'm concerned. My mind. Uh, and, although I did, there was one year that I volunteered for uh, NASA SDO, the Solar Dynamics Observatory. Mm -hmm. And we went to, of all things in all the world, we went to... Um, WonderCon. Thank you, WonderCon. Because for some reason I said mini WebCon in my head, and that was not the same thing. Nope. We, <laughs> and uh, which is sort of like Comic-Con, but it, uh, slightly, it's the same company, actually. It's just a little bit smaller event. Venue, um, here at the Anaheim Convention Center. And I was one of the few people who was lucky enough to stand at one of the, the posts with representing NASA's Solar Dynamics Observatory and have people walk by and say, wait, 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 the real NASA? And what are you doing here? <laughs> and, you know, why why mm -hmm. space? And it, it was fascinating yeah, to me because yes, these are people space? who and, and are already interested in sci-fi. Right. Right? They're interested in science fiction, but they had like no care in the world about science fact, which just was so bizarre to me in so many ways. And so I got to say, yes, yes, the real NASA. And then they would say, well, why why should I care about space? What are we even doing in space? And uh, it was it was, it was was interesting. And sometimes it does depend on the person. And you're right, some people just don't care at all. But you have to figure out what level that they're at, what their interest is in. Um, one guy came over and he happened to be wearing a football jersey and a couple of his friends. And I was like, oh, football, awesome. Well, did you know that some of the padding inside of your helmets that you wear to protect your head during all that fun stuff that you do you call sports ball um was helped to, <laughs> nasa helped develop some of that padding and he suddenly went oh yeah you're right it wasn't a sports company it wasn't gatorade it wasn't nike it wasn't whoever makes your you know your helmets part of that development came from nasa and it was a spin-off thing and and not everyone considers those to be really important but it opened his eyes just a little bit to say, oh, now I kind of understand. What else has NASA done? Awesome, great. Well, what else has NASA done? Here we are talking about the Solar Dynamics Observatory. So it was just one way to get in on one little thing. Um, there have been other times when we actually, we were having some International Space Station passes. Yeah, actually, uh, that was mentioned in the chat room here, right? which was... Um, um I'll let you find that. But yeah. I, I actually ran out and I grabbed some of my, the neighbor kids in our cul-de-sac who were like 10 and 7 at the time. And I was like, come on, kids, we're going outside. And they were like, why? It's the middle of the night. What are we doing? And I said, don't worry. I'm not your creepy neighbor. Let's just look outside <laughs> and watch the International Space Station go over. And they go, oh, cool, a shooting star. And I was like, better than a shooting star. That is a station, a space station, mm -hmm. where there's humans on board. And they were like, what? 
<laughs> like it was such a weird thing for them. And um, thankfully their parents actually came with them and it was even weirder for them too. A couple great comments. So Corkspin said, uh, taking them outside to show them the International Space Station totally. pass is always good, absolutely. Um, and then Chris Hollett said, you have to make people realize how small we are. Change their perception huh. of life. Carl Sagan's pale blue dot is what changed my perception. I think that's a good one too. So there are certainly that's good huge. television shows uh, that help you do that. Um, yeah, Carl Sagan's Cosmos and even Neil deGrasse Tyson's Cosmos. Um, uh, really, when Neil deGrasse Tyson and Seth MacFarlane and Fox, of all people in the universe, decided to team up to recreate Carl Sagan's Cosmos, I nearly wet myself. I was so ridiculously excited about it. it Fox it doesn't always, uh, as a company, feel to me... Personally, I will take all of this opinion onto myself with this one, uphold all of the best things that humanity is. You're thinking specifically about Fox News, maybe? Just saying. So, uh, when I heard that Fox was willing to put themselves out on the line, right? To, mm -hmm. I mean, they took a chance mm -hmm. on science-based programming. In prime time. In prime time! Because they sure as hell could have just put it on at 2 o'clock in the morning. They could have put it on at 11 o'clock in the morning. They could have put it on at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. But they didn't. And that was really, really fascinating to me. Um, I was really appreciative that they took that chance. And Seth MacFarlane, man... He, I can't say enough good things about that dude. Honestly, like, I may not always get his sense of humor, and you may not either, but s the stuff that he's investing in, uh, I can really get behind. So there is a bit of debate going on in the, in the chat room uh, mm -hmm. for, from one user saying we need to develop faster than light drive first before we do anything else. Um, I completely and totally disagree with the we need to develop X before we can do Y. Right. The reason for that is uh, you could say the exact same thing about all exploration through the history of humanity. You could say that about anything about anything, right? And if we continually wait for the next best thing to come out before we do why? If we continue to wait for right. X before Y happens, we will get nowhere. We will do nothing. Nothing will ever get done. We'll explore nothing. We will learn nothing. We will be nothing. So rather than waiting for that, let's go out there and explore right now. We don't need that as a tool. That is one of the one of the tools we will have down the road, potentially, mm -hmm. to make this happen. And actually, I think there's even a comment about that in our uh, in our show from yeah, last, there, uh, this there last totally episode. Is. And, but that is not a necessity, and we shouldn't wait for things like that. We should be going out there and do, taking baby steps and right. learning along the way of things that we need, things that we can do right now, today, to get humans on Mars. We don't need to wait for FTL to get to Mars. Right. We can make that journey pretty easily today if we choose to do it. Mm -hmm. I think that's a key thing here is we can go to Mars now, but someone needs to choose to make that a priority. And there are very few entities who have chosen to do that. So, while awesome words, slightly off topic. The other things you True. can do to evangelize space. You can say what I just said. Which is what we're here to do, right? I'm actually kind of surprised we didn't name our show Space Evangelists, but that's be a, neither here nor there. Uh, there are... I like tomorrow better. Great. Uh, <laughs> there are, we, what we have done, create this show, you don't have to do. And you don't have to necessarily point people to this show. We appreciate you it if you do. Should. But you, you don't have to. Uh, but... Besides, like, the t-shirts and whatnot, we continually try to keep ourselves open, our ears open, to having those conversations with people. Space up. Oh, space up is a good one. Space up is an amazing one. If you can get somebody to a space up and they walk away not excited about space, then they're just never going to be excited about space. Keep in mind that people are very much so in weirdly two parties right there are the think of them as introverts and extroverts they're the people who are going to be excited about space and there's people who are not going to give a flying banana about space and you can't change everybody and that's okay we need some of those fools to stay here until the asteroid comes and blows us all up in order to support those of us who are going to get off this rock okay so those two people are very very important but in the same time, there's a whole bunch of these people who sort of sit in the middle not realizing that they are excited about space or could be excited about space. I think a lot of people, kind of like Ben was saying or has said before, that when he was younger, he was really excited about space. And as he grew up, it wasn't as cool. It wasn't as neat. It wasn't as interesting. And there wasn't as much stuff kind of going on. It was NASA's doing this. And that was it. And everyone either knew about it or didn't know about it. And that was all. But 
Think about it. Think of all of the interesting, crazy, fascinating stuff that's going. We just put a freaking balloon in space and then lit it up and then brought it back. Like, this is crazy stuff, right? This is happening every single day. And as long as you are trying to maintain some sort of, you know, keeping your finger on the pulse, right? Mm -hmm. As long as you're interested in it and you're open to discussing your interest with other people, you can get other people excited about it, right? As long as you're excited, you can get other people excited. And don't try period. to, like you said, don't try to convert absolutely everyone. No. I think that I think that's wrong. There are some people who, like, like, like you mentioned, um, some people like myself who were passionate about space and then lost that passion. I think those are the best people... Uh, to get excited about space again because they are actually excited about space. Right. They just don't remember that they're excited about space. They had forgotten how awesome the cosmos are and they just need someone to help light that spark within them again and then they will be excited about the cosmos again and then they'll see where we're at with all of these things because they probably haven't been following X-Core, Mast and Space Systems, Virgin Galactic. I mean, maybe they've heard about it kind of in the off time but right. haven't actually... Uh, sunk in and then they'll start getting awesome saying oh these are things we can do not just in my lifetime but within this decade and some of these things you know within the next couple of years right and, and it's it's really truly a very exciting time to be alive all right so uh, that's our comments on it and the, the chat room has been uh uh crazy pants they haven't listened to a single thing i've said no i mean well there's there's some debates going on inside <laughs> the chat room it's uh uh, yeah, yeah, but it, you know, uh, I'd love to know what you guys think. So post your comments if you're a Space Fit Cast patron, post them over on Patreon. Um, then we'll actually mark you in the show if we use your comment as mm -hmm. a patron. That, that makes it really helpful. That's the best place to post your comments right now. Uh, we've got our own Reddit mm -hmm. subreddit. Uh, so reddit.com slash r slash T-M-R-O, that's another really great place to have conversations. It's kind of think of it as a the forum of tomorrow, almost. Uh, I'll also, of course, the YouTube, where we post the, the videos on YouTube. Go ahead and post your comments there. What do you think about getting people around you excited? How do you do it? Uh, what do you find works best? In a non, like, I need you, you, you non, have to think, you, you don't need to make people think like you. Right. Just get them excited. Keep in mind that there are ways to be excited about things without coming off like crazy foil hat guy. Mm. Like in the chat room, crazy foil hat guy. Just, just, you know, words of advice. That's all I'm saying. Yep. All right. On that note, we're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, comments from our last show. Stay with us. We'll be right back. One, zero, lift off. The fleet of space shuttles are doing amazing things in space. We've got all your space geekery right here. And welcome back to tomorrow. Now, before we get into our comments from our last week's show, I did want to say a quick thank you to all the patrons of tomorrow who helped make this specific segment of Tomorrow go. These are all the patrons who have contributed, what, are just saying tomorrow way too many times in a row? No, it's actually all of the names. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, it gets smaller each week, right? Well, this is, this is everyone Pretty who's- Pretty soon, if you squint your eyes, you'll be able to see two dolphins kissing. <laughs> These are all- <laughs> <laughs> these Sorry. are these are all the patrons of tomorrow who have contributed one dollar or more to help make this specific episode happen and there are a lot of you we are currently at just over 536 dollars per episode uh to make tomorrow happen and a huge thank you to everyone our next stretch goal is at six hundred dollars so we're very very close we have twenty we are now over twenty thousand subscribers on youtube with over 10 million views if every subscriber on youtube contributed one dollar per episode imagine where we could take this show it would be awesome i do have to give a quick shout out to um i forget exactly the number was but i believe it was two uh twenty one hundred uh or sorry twenty one thousand one hundred ninety three if I remember correctly, YouTube subscriber, uh, which is a fellow barista of mine, <laughs> she was so excited. She actually took a screenshot of, of her this number. Is, this is the yeah, which number I am. Uh, so thank you, Jackie. Appreciate your patronage there. All right, let's go ahead and get started <laughs> with some of our comments from the last show. This one comes from John, uh, who is also a patron of Tomorrow, I believe. Nice. Uh, John Birdsed says, uh, The first teams of astronauts slash colonists to land on Mars to establish the first colony need to be trained in multiple, multiple disciplines. A good example is the Green Beret Alpha teams, which are made up of 12 members. Each member has their primary specialty, but they have to cross-train each other, so in the end, each member is very knowledgeable in each discipline. 
Uh, yeah, absolutely. Brilliant. I, I especially love this idea. Yeah, absolutely. Well, no, I think this is when we do this at first. This is absolutely going to be a thing that has to happen, which yeah. is everyone's cross trained on everything else. Yep. Now, certainly, you're an expert in your field. Yep. But you, you know, your job would be to make everyone else also experts in your field as well, because you may, you'll need each other. You will literally need each other to survive. So, absolutely. I think the one absolutely. joke that keeps coming up, and and I don't entirely mean it 100 percent as a joke is that uh, some of the first colonists need to be some of the Rumspringer uh, teens from the Amish country, <laughs> right? Because the Rumspringer, if you're unfamiliar, it's sort of a rite of passage. And uh, the teens are kind of forced out of the community into the quote-unquote... Real world? Well, they're not, they don't call it the real world. but to, The other world? You know, our, our world. world. Uh, so they can experience, you know, what internet's like, what smoking's like, drinking, you know, all of that kind of stuff, dancing. Uh, I apologize for any Amish who might be watching that I'm... Offending, um, that but but so that they can make a, an an informed choice sure. to go back to the community with, with which they were raised. But the idea being that we nab the Rumspringer kids and we send them to Mars because they already know how to till the soil. They already know how to make buildings. They already have really good values. They're already used to not having internet and light and like all of this other they stuff. They are like perfectly. They suited are for perfectly, Mars. and they're young. <laughs> and then we every year there's a new batch. It's great. Like I love this idea. Again, kind of kidding. Not 100% kidding. This next comment, before you dig yourself into a deeper hole, is from Stephen. Yes. Also a patron of tomorrow. Stephen says... <laughs> Stephen says, About the mini magnetic field, Mars's southern hemisphere is riddled with them, so the south would be where you would want to land. Actually, that was in regards to last week's show, or the last show we did. Uh, we talked about the magnetic fields on the moon and right. how they were pretty weak, but they were able to pr uh, prevent radiation from mm -hmm. seeping in there, which actually helps you on the uh, Mars also. Some Something I hadn't considered. If that, if there are magnetic fields on Mars, even though Mars is a dead planet, right. um, you know the Moon isn't a planet. It didn't it didn't have a magnetosphere, so right. it's it's really dead, and it has magnetic uh, magnetic fields. So right. Mars may still have a few magnetic fields out there. If you land in those areas and try to use that magnetic field to help you against the solar radiation, that might be a really good place for you to actually go. So uh, something I hadn't considered before. Um, it's a uh, it's a, it's a really good idea as to where to start putting those initial colonies before we can drill to the center of Mars and restart the core. <clears throat> All right, this one comes from Bender Space, who actually this was on our subreddit from slash r slash tmro. Awesome. Uh, Bender Space says, I agree that there are things that need to be done before any boots and bottoms get to Mars. However, it seems that we in the space community tend to oversimplify things to the point of, quote, well, if I had blank, then FTL. it would make... Oh, okay. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Then that would make blank... No, uh, no, Adam. Tra travel into space. Okay, so much simpler. Unquote. Warp drive is just one part of what is going to make humanity reach the stars, but there are thousands of other things that need to be figured out as well. Radiation, zero G, food, life support, etc. And at least those problems have a shot at being solved within my lifetime. Absolutely, right? We cannot wait for... I already went on this... I already stepped on this soapbox in this show. So refer to earlier part of show for this soapbox. <laughs> I think I, I, I should have waited till this part to get on that soapbox. We should just edit that part out. Just move it. <laughs> stick it in the TV right over here. I can just be like, <laughs> yes, mm -hmm. I agree with me. So uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, don't... Waiting is the worst possible thing you can do. Do it now. Do what you can now. Get out there. We can do all of these things. We just need to learn. And well, um, see, so you just took your own advice. You didn't wait for this comment to come up. I didn't wait. I did it now. You just gave your opinion whenever you damn well felt. <laughs> that's 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 true. All right, <laughs> Nuke Dan from also from our Reddit page says the following. I know everyone is just dying to get their boots and bottoms onto Mars. Uh, By the way, I boots want boots and, and bottoms. Because <laughs> it's the second time somebody said it, and I want that on a t-shirt. <laughs> boots and bottoms on Mars. That, that's the t-shirt. Boots and bottoms and boots and bottoms. Okay, uh, I know everyone is just dying to get their boots and bottoms onto Mars, but I think we are missing a few crucial steps between that goal and where we are right now. This show keeps the flames burning under our dreams of our second home planet. <laughs> Wait, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Am I burning your dreams or am I keeping... Keeping them alive. I'm not sure which. Know, well, he says rightly so. So either okay. way, he's in agreement. <laughs> Dan's like, you're burning my dreams to the ground. An Thank you very much. Interesting way to word that up. All right, continue. Uh, in the near term, we need to be developing, in my opinion, two important technologies. Fueling ships from asteroids and braking systems so that we 
need not hit the atmosphere of our target planet at quote unquote ludicrous speed. We don't slow down our car at home by hitting the back of the wall of the garage going 75 miles per hour. Now do we? Yeah, actually, and that's what we're working on with the LDSD. Right. The the the, you, the r- thing that we mentioned in the beginning. <laughs> we're at that point of the show. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> Just think, we only have eight more of these things oh, to go. Yeah. I put a lot of comments in the yes, show. Yes, you did. Um, but yeah, I totally agree. Absolutely. Uh, it goes back to the... Uh, um, the concept of let's just do what we can right now. And uh, I'm glad that this is uh, keeping your passion for getting to Mars. And, and actually someone in the chat room earlier said it's it's us and always about Mars. Mars feels like the next natural step, but we don't rule anything out. No. We, are, we are like, we're not some of those pro-Mars guys who are like, only That's Mars. That's not entirely true. <clears throat> there are some things we rule out, like landing on the sun. Even at night, not a good idea. <laughs> Just but so hot. In, in general, in general, no. Uh, we we as Mars, tomorrow moon, feel as though Europa. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Uh, sure, all of, all of these things. All of the above. Absolutely, we're, we're totally okay with that. <clears throat> it's all about baby steps, exactly as Ben is saying. You do what you can now. The other nice thing about NASA spinoffs, I feel personally, if I can take a slight tangent, is that. A lot of times you're developing something for a particular need, right? You're developing the the padding for something to go on the International Space Station because sure. you only have so much room and beds or whatever the case is. You don't is. want to bonk your head and bleed in space. Precisely. And then event- that comes around and you're like, hey, actually this could have this other cool application. And so it's... It's this weird spin-off-y sort of situation. So if you keep waiting for that one big thing, you're probably never going to get there because that a smaller breakthrough could come earlier on should you had you been making these baby steps along the way. Absolutely. If that makes any sense. By the way, did it totally backwards. Mm, no, and um, I've, I've spoken out against spin-offs before. Yeah. I'm not anti-spin-off. I think no, the no, spin-offs no. are fine. I, I For clarification, I don't think you should use spin-offs as a way to justify a program when it's getting its initial funding. Yeah. The program needs to stand on its own two feet without the spin-offs. Otherwise, just do the spin-off. That's my opinion. Right. All right. <clears throat> uh, this is from uh, <laughs> ULA Sucks. I wonder what they think about ULA. I, they're the biggest fan. Uh, what, what do we need to get to Mars? I'd say some sort of demonstration of a relatively self-sustaining habitat in an extreme environment. The ISS is a great example, but to test even more technology required at a cheaper cost. How about doing some more work on the scientific basis and on bases in Antarctica or underwater research labs where technologies such as food production, miniaturized medical facilities, atmosphere slash water recycling, and in-situ resource extraction can be rapidly tested and evaluated. Absolutely. We agreed. And so we created a miniaturized testing lab right here. <laughs> so here is a... <laughs> Just kidding. So... Um, <laughs> um, no, that's actually a really good idea. Uh, I think we do some of that right now. You, you look at the Mars Society, and they've got <clears throat> uh, Habs out in the middle of freaking nowhere uh, trying to do a lot of these things, simulating what it would be like on Mars as best they can. Underwater is a really good place to do it because yeah. it is also an extremely harsh environment, uh, and it's really, I mean, <clears throat> you're locked in there. Yeah, you're not you, going anywhere You fast. need to be self-sufficient. So, yeah, absolutely. I think that's a great idea, though. More of that. More of that concurrently with us going out into space. Never thought I'd say that James Cameron had the right idea, but there he is. What? What's wrong with James Cameron? I'm just giving, I don't know. All right, know. Uh, this one comes Sorry. from Christopher. Christopher Carr, uh, which is a comment from YouTube. Thank you very much. Thanks, YouTube. Thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> uh, Dimos and Phobos uh, oh, sorry. A Dimos and Phobos mission first. Much cheaper, safer, and easier. Real-time uh, teleparate? Teleoperate. Teleoperate robots on the surface of Mars, and what a view. Yeah, absolutely. So these are the, for those who don't know, these would be the, the moons of Mars, Martian moons. Uh, do we have... Apparently I can't speak. Oh, uh, we don't have, we have, we have posters all around our, our house of all the different things that I was looking for. I don't think that, we but have But we don't, moons. we don't, <clears throat> we don't have the moons. Um... Not a bad idea. Uh, the advantage of going there is you don't have the atmosphere to deal with, so it's a little. It's actually a little easier to land in because uh, you don't have that nasty Martian atmosphere that's, like I said earlier, you know, thick enough to create a problem, but not thick enough to actually help slow you down enough. Uh, so you can just kind of just like the moon, essentially, um, and you would have an. It would be like landing on the moon here, looking back at Earth, but you would have Mars right there. Yeah, it would be an that'd epic be view. Cool. Uh, I think we should do that too. I think we should go to Mars. I think we should go to Mars's moons. I think we should go to our moon. I think we should go to anywhere we can land and, and safely put humans. Those are the destinations we should all go to. I think we here at tomorrow should just figure out like who should have what. We should figure out how to build tomorrow today. Oh, wow. 
building tomorrow today. Wow. wow. Yeah. And you can take that to the bank. All right. Um, <laughs> Callisto. 8413. Yay. Also from YouTube. Also from YouTube. Says, you know, there will be failures. Going to Mars will be like Europe colonizing the new world. A few failures here, some profit there, different reasons, different goals. It will likely take over a hundred years before Mars can be declared an independent society. Mars will go to the nation or nations who can stare failure in the face and say, no, you will not stop us. I, I think they will be a little more fierce than that, but yes, absolutely. Um, yeah, I, I think once we get enough humans on our Martian colony to make it self-sustainable, mm -hmm. uh, we'll be at a point where, yeah, they'll probably break away and become an independent colony because that has pretty much happened all throughout human history. So uh, history has a nasty habit of repeating itself. And that's most likely what will happen once once they become uh, also self-sufficient. we already have the flags. And we have the flags. And that, that's probably in response to all the really cool flags that we showed. Uh, in fact, speaking of the flags, the next comment uh, Stefan? Yeah. Or Stephen? Stefan. Stefan Schuler from also from YouTube says, Love the flags. I would pay for those t-shirts too. So subtle, so to the point. Just seeing them gets me hyped. Check out uh, the Tomorrow Live episode 7.17. It was actually in the comments section as well, so segment three near the end of the show. It's actually near the very, very end of that particular show mm -hmm. where we show you all these really cool flags that an, a Reddit author had created. Mm -hmm. And uh, what we should do is we should find – I really think we should find the Reddit author and ask to bring them back. Because yeah, I thought they were amazing. They were they were exactly as Stefan mentioned. They were so cool. Super subtle, straight to the point, yep. really cool looking, and kind of had this cool like imagine the future sort of yeah. feel to them. Um, I, I loved them. Love I absolutely them. loved them. Totally. And uh, our final comment for the show is from Michael V. Michael says, V, also from YouTube, says, Warp Drive is fantasy fiction with zero basis in science. Do not be <laughs> fooled by this pseudo-intellectual nonsense. You're far more likely to find those flame duck space unicorns, and you'd be on a far more scientific footing. <laughs> So how do you really feel about uh, FTL Drive, Michael? <laughs> uh, I will say that I've yet to see anything today that would allow for a FTL Drive, faster than light drive. Right. Um, or, or some, even if you're not going faster than the speed of light, bending space around you is right. another thing where you're kind of simulating it so you're not breaking, uh, breaking any rules. But... I, I don't like the word never or impossible. Yeah. I'm, I'm not fans of those words. And um, you, you don't, something's impossible only until it isn't anymore. Right. Right? The four minute mile was impossible. The human body could not do that mm -hmm. until we did it. Mm -hmm. and, and, and now it's possible suddenly. It was four minute mile or seven minute mile? It doesn't well, matter. Whatever minute mile it was. Well, we're going to the four minute mile <laughs> four is minute. possible. The people. one minute mile, people. <laughs> one minute mile. You heard it here first. <laughs> kind of <kinda laughs> deflated my argument with uh, questioning what I was saying there. Not but, the point. Uh, not the point. You get the fundamental well, idea. Well, but really, I mean, going to the moon was impossible. It was, especially on the technology. For a long had. time, it was impossible. And we've done it. We've been there. We've sent multiple humans to the moon, and we will go back, and we will have colonies on the moon. And going to Mars is impossible. Right. And yet we will go there. You know, it's so, everything was impossible at some point in time until it isn't anymore. And so, no, I, I you know, uh, Michael basically argues, look, it flies in the face of science. It flies in the face of science as we understand it today. There you go. And our understanding of science and what we're able to do and how we can manipulate things and, and the environment and cheat certain things um, is growing every day. And it may not happen in our lifetime, but I, I, I don't know that it will ever happen. But I'd like to think that maybe it will someday and that it's not impossible. It's just really freaking hard. All right, that's our show for this week. I'd like to thank everyone so much for joining us. Uh, stay tuned. After Dark is up next. We'll have another show next week. And then the, we're actually starting to bring on some live guests again. So Yay. stay tuned. If you're a patron of tomorrow, you'll get live guest notifications in advance. So you can ask your questions, have them write in, and so that you can ask your questions of our guests. Uh, I'd like to thank everyone so much for watching, and we'll see you next week. You better believe these are CubeSats because that's not 37 full satellites. No. <laughs> um, most of those payloads are going to turn back towards the Earth gab gathering imagery for environmental and security purposes. And this is the 20th flight since 1999. If you look at the side graphic, actually, it says uh, uh, 19...
successes, which means there was one failure of Aww. the flight. Yeah. Uh, and this was in, if I remember right, this was a three-stage configuration because you can use, you can get the Depner rocket in three, four, or five stages. In fact, I believe this was a three-stage rocket, but I don't actually have that data in front of me. You can get it? Well, if you have enough money, <laughs> <laughs> certainly anyone can buy one if you got enough money. Uh, <laughs> Speaking of Russia, they're eyeing the Soyuz for upgrades to allow for a lunar, like kind of Apollo 8 figure mm -hmm. style around the moon, but for citizen astronauts. Uh, so cool. Tom Shelley of Space Adventures is the president, uh, was speech, speaking at the National Space Club in Florida on June 10th. And... Uh, basically talked about this this program now the space adventures they're the guys who let you go out and uh, as a space tourist go up to the international space station mm -hmm. uh tito went as a space adventure participant right. um and now they want to do tours around the moon the difference is uh 52 million dollars to get to the international space station but 150 million dollars to go around the moon and that's kind of a so use at the moon simulated graphic as you nice know. yep um but you can't just take a Soyuz and send it to the moon. That's right. not going to work. That would suck. If you've ever seen those photo, the but wait, the space shuttle went to the moon. <laughs> the space shuttle did not go to the moon. Do not spend that. <laughs> Don't do that. If people actually think that. Don't do that. Oh, fine. Uh, so uh, the Soyuz co contractor Energia plans to modify the spacecraft for what's needed to get to the moon. There's going to be things like an additional heat shield on the bottom. There's going to be a habitat module that's going to go with it because you don't want to spend, you know, essentially a week. It's a, it's three. Three there, three back, and kind of one in, in an extra. So but basically a week um, in this, I mean, Soyuz is tiny. You're like shoulder to shoulder like this. You can't do that. So there's a HAB module. Um, uh, there were other things as well. Oh, uh, they need to upgrade this ship's communication and nav systems to support a mission that far out. Because Soyuz was not designed for that. Uh, but it sounds like if they aggressively decide to do this, late 2017, 2018 is when they could actually start doing the first missions around the moon. I thought this was really cool because this is yet another, another example of a, it, it's, I don't want to call it commercial space because it is a government rocket, right. but it is, it is a commercial application for a government rocket. Yeah. And, and this is kind of, we saw the space tourists with um, the Soyuz rockets up to the space station. Mm -hmm. Now this is going around the moon. But with space station, now we're seeing like x -Core, Virgin Galactic, those kind of like right. space touristy companies kind of on the horizon here six months away. Um, maybe we'll see uh, the same thing. I, I know, the laughing in the control room. Uh, maybe we'll see the same. They will fly, by the way. So there was a while ago when SpaceX was only six months away yeah, from flight. And true. now they actually are true. flying, right? So right. they will. all these companies will hit that. And this is kind of that first step into that awesome next thing for humans going to the moon. Mm -hmm. More than just the government moon, like commercialized lunar transportation, lunar right. habs, right. stuff like that. I think it's pretty cool. So this is that first step. And I think it's pretty exciting. It is. Um, <laughs> Speaking of Russia, still, uh, they called off the maiden launch of their new uh, Angara rocket. This is a rocket that's been in the works since, oh god, the 90s. Uh, 1992 is when they started. Really? Uh, oh yeah, 92. So this is what it looks Ouch. like. Uh, this is uh, two shots, one on the pad and one kind of out to transport. It comes in many different configurations. The first maiden suborbital test flight was scheduled for June 27th. They got pretty far into the countdown, but then they had to call it off. Uh, this is the rocket family, so this is what what all the different configurations will look like. Uh, it's designed to take anywhere from a small payload up to a large payload into orbit. And uh, actually, that is not the graphic I wanted to send. That is the old version, the new version I forgot to create. So awesome. pretend like for a moment like that's the new version. Okay. And that's yeah, the, no, I mean, that, that looks great. Graphic. Look at that. It's <laughs> amazing. My fault. My bad. I put the wrong graphic up there. <laughs> <laughs> I have it in my Photoshop file. Anyhow, uh, they haven't disclosed what went wrong in the countdown, but they basically have been told, look, don't ru race this thing. We've waited long enough. You don't need to rush to figure out what the issue is. Um, uh, but yeah, this is going to essentially replace the uh, Rokot and Proton rockets, mm -hmm. if I remember right. Um, yep. Uh, yep, uh, from Russia. So this will kind of consolidate everything over. At first, it's not designed to be human rated. The initial flights are cargo only, but it is eventually designed to carry humans up to space as well. So this could essentially become kind of a unified core. And that's the neat thing about this rocket is it has a unified core um, that right. you basically just kind of move around along the different uh, systems. So it's kind of the same unified concept as the uh, Atlas Delta rockets that we're using here in the U U.S. You just kind of keep tacking cores on the side for however much like Lego bricks like Legos Russia built a rocket Lego yay yeah, isn't that awesome International Space Station is going to get an x-ray machine 
But this is crazy pants. Uh, well, and the thing is that, like, last week, uh, or was the week before, I don't recall, uh, we talked about the International Space Station getting an espresso machine. Yes. Which we all went gaga well, No, over. actually, no, we, we talked about it on the After Dark show. Oh, that's that right. Wasn't the, that was only available live and only available to patrons. So, um, yes, yeah, so they're getting an espresso machine right. and an x-ray machine now. And an x-ray machine. Our well... B- it's what every International Space Station needs. <laughs> this is their first medical x-ray scanner. Uh, they're going to use it to, to study uh, rats. Basically, here's what happens. You go up into space, and you start losing uh, muscle and, and bone, bone density. Uh, density. Right. And you can do this insane regimen of rats. basic idea is this is a uh, t- technology to help us decelerate as we come into an, a low atmos- a low particulate atmosphere like Mars, right? right? So the Mars atmosphere is dense enough to become a problem but thick enough to still, what am I trying to say? But not thick enough to actually help go. slow you down correctly, <laughs> like on Earth, right? Right. <laughs> That's enough to be a problem, but thick enough to be a problem is what I almost said. So uh, what this does is it's basically um, this deceleration system that um, inflates kind of on the outside. Mm-hmm. That inflation is called the SIA, the supersonic inflatable aerodynamic decelerator. It kind of creates this balloon on the outside of the heat shield almost doubling the size or over doubling, I, I don't remember, uh, the size of the uh, aerodynamic surface mm-hmm. that it can use to aero break right. in the Mar- Martian atmosphere, or in this case, the upper Earth atmosphere. Um, looks like they are going to get data from this, so data is good because it is yeah. a test vehicle. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, in the chat room, they're like, oh, it failed. Well, it, it didn't fail. It's a test vehicle. Anything that happens to the vehicle, whether it was expected or unexpected, is data and is good. Right. So uh, congratulations to NASA, and I believe this was a JPL project. I I remember, you right? can learn from your mistakes. Absolutely. And and um, uh, it looked it was really cool. It was really fun to watch. All right, moving right along. Uh, this uh, last week on June 19th at 19.11 and 11 seconds coordinated time, yes. Russia launched Dep- Depner, Depner, Den- I can't say, Den- Den- Depner, Depner. Uh, with 37 <laughs> satellites. Here's some launch footage. Vusha goes. Uh, this is a Soviet-era ballistic missile. It's been modified to haul spacecraft instead of, you know, nuclear bombs. And uh, the payload is the most number of individual satellites ever launched on a single rocket. That number, again, was 37 satellites. Coming up, rocket launch. Parachute test. Space launch system mini me. Plus, we're gonna be talking about space evangelism. Stay tuned. Tomorrow begins right now. And welcome to tomorrow, episode 7.18 for Saturday, June 28th, 2014. My name is Benjamin Higginbotham. With me as always, the beautiful, lovely, wonderful, and talented Carrie Ann Higginbotham. If you're joining us live, we just had a fun session looking at the Low Density Supersonic Decelerator, LDSD. We were watching it live and as a community kind of participating. So I encourage you every Saturday at 2100 Coordinated Universal Time to join us live. It's a, it's a lot of fun. Before we get started with some space news, uh, let's go ahead and thank all of the patrons of tomorrow who have helped make this episode go. These are the patrons who have contributed at least $10 for this specific episode. You can get more information at patreon.com slash T-M-R-O, we are a crowdfunded show, and so every single dollar helps. You know, $10 per month or per month per show is a lot for a lot of people, yeah. uh, but you don't have to contribute that amount if, if there's a different dollar value that works for you, and you'll see that a little bit later on throughout the show. All right, as, as I was mentioning um, in the open, um, we did just watch LDSD, the Low Density Supersonic Decelerator. We don't actually have video because it literally just happened <laughs> right before we went live, um, but it looks like they did have a bad parachute deployment so the 